When creating Python programs, you'll likely want to store data in some way, whether that's populating data in an application automatically or saving data between user sessions. Databases help you do this. They provide an organized structure so you can easily access, store, and manage large amounts of data. In this course, we'll create three real-world example projects with integrated databases. The first one is a book API that serves data from a database using the Fast API web framework. The second project covers how to work with databases in a data analysis setting with Jupyter Notebook, Pandas, and Matplotlib. The last project is a full stack application built on Flask. It'll be a web application that helps you keep track of a set of projects and associated tasks. Hi, my name is Katherine Hodge and I'm a software engineer. Join me in my LinkedIn learning course all about working with databases in Python so you can level up your Python applications. Let's get started. In this chapter, we'll be creating an API that serves data from a database. API stands for Application Programming Interface. Let's walk through this acronym. The interface is the contract with which two separate programs agree upon to communicate. Let's say program A, a mobile app, wants to send data to program B, a backend service for storage. Program A and program B will agree on a contract or an interface for how that data will be sent and its format. Once the interface is agreed upon, developers write code so that the data is sent in the correct format with the correct communication protocol. It's used in applications, which is where application comes from an API, so they can communicate and transfer data. It's done through programming, hence application programming interface. An example where an API is commonly used is in the case of data retrieval. Let's say the mobile app wants to display dynamic data like the weather. They'll likely use an API to communicate with the backend service that has access to live weather information in a database. There are different types of APIs that use different protocols, but the most popular of these are REST APIs. With a REST API, the client, in our case, the mobile app, sends requests to the server. The server uses what the client sent to decide what data to return back to the client as a response. Now you might be wondering, why can't the mobile app just have all the data we need within it? It could have a weather database, a database with all the account information, and more. Well, this would make the mobile app very big. It would contain lots of code, and it would be hard for several teams to work on at once. The mobile app should be focused on delivering information and visuals to the user, not on how to make data retrieval as efficient as possible. There might also be another system that wants to use the weather information too, but it might live outside of the mobile app. This is why we often separate components to increase the reusability and decrease the complexity of a single system. In fact, we do this a lot with backend services to create microservices that can be reused for many different applications. When building an API, there are a few different libraries and frameworks you can use within Python. Flask is one option. It's a Python-based micro-framework used by developers to make micro-web services. We'll be exploring Flask later in this course when we build a full-stack application. Another option is Django. Django is a Python-based REST framework that supports templating, routing, authentication, and management tools by default. It also integrates with SQLite, MongoDB, and DynamoDB. There's also Falcon. Falcon is a high-performance REST framework focused on quality control. It's used to build reliable application backends and easily integrates with NoSQL. Given all of these, the technology we'll be building our API with is FastAPI. FastAPI is a modern high-performance web framework for building APIs with Python 3.7 and higher. It's easy to use, very fast, and minimizes code duplication. It's also fully compatible with OpenAPI and JSON schema. There are other API frameworks in Python that I haven't mentioned here, 
but Fast API and Flask are the most popular. That's why we'll be focusing on them in this course. Let's create a basic web application in Python using Fast API. To start off, we'll create a virtual environment, and we'll call it Books. This will store all of our project's dependencies. Let's CD into it and activate it. Now we can install our dependencies. To use Fast API, we have to have the Fast API dependency. We'll also install Uvicorn so we can run our API on a web server. Without the web server, we won't be able to run our API. Let's create a folder for our Python code. We'll call it books API and we'll CD into it. Inside of this folder, we'll create a file called main.py. Let's head over to Sublime. main.py, and we're saving it in our books API folder. Let's import Fast API and create a new application. From Fast API, import Fast API. We'll use this to create a new app. This initializes our application. Going back to REST endpoints, every REST API is based on a contract. The client knows what URL or what endpoint to send a request in order to get the information they want back. This means in creating our books API, we'll define a contract that tells our clients what endpoints or what URL will retrieve data, as well as what the client will need to send in order to get that data. Before we dive too deep into that, Let's create a basic endpoint or route on our API that returns some simple text. We'll put this on the home route of our application. With this piece of code, we say, when the user makes a GET request on the home route, we'll run this function. GET is a special type of request that the client makes to retrieve information. The home route is always defined as a slash. When the client hits the endpoint or sends a request to the home route, we'll return a simple welcome string. Welcome to the books API. Now let's run our application. Since it's an API, we'll need to use the Uvicorn tool in order to run it. Uvicorn will run a server on our computer and we will act as the client that requests information from the home route. Let's return to the main directory of this application, books. From here, we'll run our app. Uvicorn books API dot main app dash dash reload. In the output, we can see our application running on localhost or 127.0.0.1 on port 8000. Let's send a request to this application from the browser. We'll access 127.0.0.1 on port 8000. And there's our message, welcome to the books API. We can also see the documentation of this API at the docs route or the docs endpoint. So we'll add docs and here's our documentation. This comes for free with fast API. In our application, we allow get requests on the home route. When someone requests information, we return a string or text data. We've just created a very simple Python API using the Fast API framework. The purpose of our API is to host book data and allow different clients to access it. The book data will live in a database. Before we can store it there, we need to define the schema for what we will store about a book and how we will store it. We'll be using SQL Alchemy to create our schema and access the data in our database. Let's install it in its dependency, MySQL Connector. We'll be doing this in a virtual environment, so let's activate it. And we'll install MySQL Connector. We'll also install SQL Alchemy. Perfect. Now we can look at some SQL Alchemy code that defines the schema. If you're using the exercise files, these are located within the Books API folder in a file called database.py. SQL Alchemy is a module in Python that helps you communicate with your database. Instead of writing raw SQL statements, 
you can declare the interactions of your application in the database in a more Pythonic way. Let's dive into the code. This application connects to a MySQL database. That's the engine defined at the top. Then it defines some models using the SQL Alchemy ORM. Each model represents a table. For example, the author model represents a table of authors. It has columns for author ID, first name, and last name. Another table called books is represented with the book model. Each book will have an ID, title, and set number of pages. The last model is book authors. Its columns are ID, author ID, and book ID. This helps us associate the book data with the author data. To learn more about the SQL Alchemy ORM, I encourage you to check out my other database course, Advanced Python Working with Databases. This other course goes deeper into the inner workings of SQL Alchemy, while here, we'll briefly touch on it so we can focus on the overall application. Now, before we run this Python file, we need to create a books database. That's what we connect to when we run the engine. SQL Alchemy cannot create databases on its own. We'll also need to install MySQL, a relational database management system, or RDBMS, that allows us to create our database. But this is a good start. We know what data we'll be storing and how we'll be storing it. Let's install and configure the tools to create a MySQL database. If you don't already have MySQL installed, you can download it from this website. I already have it installed, so I won't be installing it, but this would be the place to go to install it. Once it's installed, the path needs to be updated so we can use the MySQL shell in the command line. This will be different if you're on a Windows computer, but on a Mac, you can use what type of shell you're running to determine where to update the path. We'll use echo shell to find out which shell we're running. In this case, ours is bin zsh. This means we'll need to update our .zshrc file in our home directory. We can navigate to our home with cd tilde. Then we'll open up the file with nano.zsh. HRC. Inside of here, we have two entries that tell our shell where MySQL is located. We have the MySQL bin and MySQL support files. We add these to our path so we can execute MySQL in the command line. To save any changes to this file, we can do Control O, Enter, and then Control X. This saves our changes and exits out of the editor. With the path set, we can create our database and add some tables. We'll log into our database through the terminal with MySQL. You can use a GUI such as MySQL Workbench instead, but since we don't want to go too deep into tooling, the terminal should work great for us. To log in, we'll use sudo mysql-u root, so we're logging in with the root user, and then dash p. The first password you'll enter is for your machine, so if you're on a Mac machine or a Windows machine, what do you use to log in to your system? This is your laptop or desktop password, and it's used for sudo. Now we're on the login command. We're logging into MySQL, so we'll use the password we configured when installing MySQL. This might be different from your desktop or laptop password. And we're in. Let's create our database. It'll be called books. In another terminal window, we'll access our virtual environment and run our database.py file. Let's navigate to that file. We'll activate our environment and then run the file with python database.py. Now let's check if our tables have been added with our MySQL shell. We'll go over to our other terminal tab and query for our data. To see the tables, we can write show tables. And there they are. We created them with Python. We can also see their columns with the describe keyword. This is exactly what we set up in Python. We've successfully created a MySQL database with tables.